the military home buying process from A to Z for military moves. My name's Evan Kaufman. We at Home Loans or VA Loan Originator here to help give a good understanding of the home buying process as it relates for military families. Today, we're going to go over a few key things. Number one, we're going to talk about military considerations when buying a home. Secondly, the 10-step roadmap for home buying. Then we're going to go over some key term review, hit on some do's and don'ts in the home buying process, and then go over three easy ways to improve your home value. So first, stepping into military considerations when home buying. Overall, we vet here, we have a timing recommendation for if you're looking to buy a home. And this applies to if you're a civilian buying a home or a military family buying a home. And the basics are this. If you're debating on buying versus renting, you should ask yourselves two questions. Number one is, do you plan on having the home as a long-term rental? If you're gonna hold that home for a long time, then we usually recommend that you consider buying because over time, it just makes sense to own real estate. But if you don't wanna own a rental or you're on the fence of renting, let's say your military family and you're like, I think I might wanna rent, but I'm not sure about that. And I'm not sure if I really wanna hold a home for the long-term with tenants, then you should move to question two. Will you be at your location for at least three years? If you're gonna be there for at least three years, then you probably wanna consider buying a home. If you're not, then you might never hear a lender say it, but you might wanna consider renting. Why do we say three years? Because three years gives you enough time to start getting that pay down on the mortgage. And ideally in a market where you would see some appreciation, your home value to increase enough to where if you have to sell around that three, four year mark, you're ideally making enough money to make sure you're not underwater on your home, meaning you owe more than what you're selling the home for. And only in the last few years has it really ever been possible to buy a home and then turn around and sell it six months or a year later and come out ahead. Normally, you want to make sure you have some time. And that's why we recommend three years being a good rule for that. So you've asked yourself if you're going to have it as a long-term rental. If not, are you going to be there at least three years? That can help you make that decision. But you're here today to really know you've already decided, I want to buy the home. What does that look like? So now we're going to look at the home buying roadmap that we've laid out. 10 steps on the home buying process. So looking at step number one, it's getting yourself pre-approved or pre-qualified. So simply put, making sure you understand how much you qualify for really helps you take that first step to buying a home. Why? Think of it this way. You're looking online and you're looking at homes that are, let's say, $500,000. But then all of a sudden you go to look, you get under contract, you get your first initial estimates and find out, oh my gosh, this costs so much more. Man, I really wish I was looking at less. Well, getting pre-approved up front helps you define that search. Same happens on the reverse. You can't find anything in the price range that you think you are stuck in. If you get pre-approved or pre-qualified up front, you're going to learn, hey, maybe I could go get a bigger home than I expected because now I have an idea of what my monthly payments are, what my cash to close is. And of course, I might be a lender, so it's always easy to say, yeah, start with that for number one. But in reality, having been on the side of helping people buy and sell homes as a real estate agent and as a lender, it's important to know the number side right up front so you can help set expectations on what you need to look for when buying that home. Now, step number two follows right behind that. Sometimes we say 1A and 1B. So step number two is making sure you select your real estate agent. So these first two steps are really you getting put together your team for home buying. So finding a good real estate agent that you know and trust makes a massive impact on your home. It's one of the biggest determinants if you're going to have a successful sale in the long run after you buy that home is how well that agent helps you get into a home in the first place. So finding an agent, especially for military families who are moving from say out of state into a new area, that real estate agent is sometimes the first person you get to meet that is from that area. I myself, I know PCS and from Colorado to Ohio, I remember my agent was the first person to give me good recommendations on the area, the locations, the places to eat. Yeah, some of my buddies were there already and stationed there. They had some ideas of some stuff, but they weren't there for 10, 20 years, or they hadn't been in and out of a whole lot of homes and known the different neighborhoods. Your agent's a powerful part of that. And so you want to make sure you make that connection up front. Now, when you have those two selected, step one being making sure you got your pre-approval, your pre-qualification, you're working with your lender, and you got your agent, you've now got your home buying team. Those are your two big folks in your corner to help you go win this next home. So then step three takes place. And this is where you really discuss your needs with your lender and with your agent. So you might've had your initial talk, initial pre-qualification, initial discussion about some homes, but we always put this to step three, make sure that you have your buyer needs analyzed. So you have that deep discussion with your agent. 
of why you need so many bedrooms, why that neighborhood's important for you. Same with your lender. Hey, why is it important for me to stay within a certain budget? Those kinds of things. So for example, as a lender, when you're working with us and we're analyzing your needs, we're going over, hey, what could the potential costs look like for some hypothetical home buying scenarios? We're surprised how many times buyers haven't had that discussion with their lender. They just got a pre-approval letter that said, go buy a home. And they have no clue what could the monthly costs be or the down payment. So they're looking online at random numbers that are never accurate. But we like to work through the discussion in step three of making sure that you understand and have some level of expectation on what monthly payment can look like and down payment. So we attack all that up front. So there's no surprises when you're under contract. Now, step one, two, three gets you all ready to go buy that next home. Step four is you ultimately going out and looking at those homes. This is where you might hear the term showings. I'm going on showings. My agent's doing a showing for me. Now for military families, that might be in person, or we see a lot of our clients doing virtual showings. So those agents going out there doing FaceTime, or they're using some other mediums to make sure they can get it virtually. So showings doesn't just have to be in person, but this is where you go out and look. Now this is where we tell folks for home buying, don't be surprised if you find a home sooner than you expect. Some people think you got to go look at 10, 20, 30 homes. We typically see folks settling on a home around their fourth showing. So somewhere between three and five, people usually end up having a good idea of what they want, and they end up starting getting ready for the next step that we're going to talk about. Does that sound shocking? Well, maybe 20, 30 years ago it would have been shocking. But think about this. Today, you're window shopping most likely dozens, if not hundreds of homes online. You're looking at them and you're pre-scanning, window shopping a whole bunch. You might have inquired about a few of those to your real estate agent or your lender some more. So maybe you got 10 or 15 that you inquired a little bit more about. And then you actually went and saw three to five and fell in love with one of those. So really you're seeing a lot and don't be surprised if it's only a few. Now we've seen some folks, of course, go look at 10, 20, 30 homes physically, and that's okay. We've had folks buy the first home they saw. Just know that you're going to see things and you might see them virtually, you might ask some more questions, and then see them in person or virtually as well. But let's say you went out, you saw all of those homes. Now, all of a sudden, we move on to our next step, step five. Step five is where we write our offer and we submit our contract to a seller. What does that mean? Well, your real estate agent is going to help you write up your contract. Your contract's going to have in it all the terms that you are proposing to a seller. So let's say you found that home you really liked, and you're like, okay, we want to offer... 500,000 on that home. Your real estate agent's the one that's gonna help you write that up and the contract will have different clauses and different stipulations within it for your potential purchase. Now we've seen one page contracts, very rare, but in the most cases, depending on what state you're in, we usually see that between five and 20 pages and there might be some more attachments, disclosures and stuff. So be ready for a lot of documents. But there's really three key things that you typically see within every contract. Number one are the contingencies. That's like your inspection clause and appraisal clause that we're going to talk on a little bit more here, making sure that the seller knows that you have the right to do those or not the right to do those. It'll also outline for you the time frame, the time frame that's going to take you to close. You start setting your deadlines. Hey, here's our offer. We propose we'll have this done in so much time. And the other thing is you're going to usually let them know how you plan on purchasing the home from a financial aspect, be that in cash, financing, and what type of financing you're going to use. So like a lot of our folks utilize the VA loan. You typically have to outline that you're going to use a VA loan. And there's some additional contract items for that that we make sure are taken care of. So that's you putting together your offer and you're going to make that to a seller. Now, next stage, step number six is where you negotiate the terms. So you've made your offer to the seller. Now, all of a sudden, the seller is going to look at that and they're going to go like, yes, great. We sign it. Good to go. Or they might negotiate some with you. This is the situation where you might offer, say, 500000 and now the seller is going to come back. You might have some back and forth. This might look like, uh, okay, you're offering five hundred, We want five ten or five twenty, And then you have that back and forth. Generally, this is through your real estate agent. You'll be working with your real estate agent to negotiate and create your strategy. And they'll be working with the seller's real estate agent to go through one another, make sure you come to good terms. Now, the end goal is to make sure that you get both parties to sign. But rewinding real quick, For making those offers, know this, negotiating works usually in scenarios when there's not a lot of offers. In our current environment, sometimes there's multiple offers on the table. You might have four, five, six, maybe 10 or more offers a seller can get. And here's the deal. 
If sellers have a whole lot of offers, put yourself in their shoes. You got, let's say five offers and they're all really strong offers. Some sellers are deciding, hey, let's not risk countering all these. Let's just accept one and move forward. Some will still try to negotiate, but oftentimes in competitive environments, you might not get a chance to negotiate. So keep that one in mind as a buyer. If your agent's telling you, hey, this is competitive, you might not get that back and forth that you might get when they don't have any other offers. So be ready for that meeting. You might want to put your best foot forward, but have that discussion with your agent. Now, let's say they have no offers. That's where we usually see some good negotiation back and forth. You just want to be aware of what you're offering on. But let's say you made that offer. There were five other offers. You weren't even the highest, but you were a VA loan. We love calling listing agents to help win over the deal. You want them over though. They want to help a vet, someone, let's say PCS in, active duty moving somewhere. Wonderful. They took your offer. Now we move on to step seven. Step seven is what I like to call the waterfall step. The waterfall step is where you have an accepted contract now. You might hear the term that you are under contract. And this is where three things start to happen simultaneously. You kick off your inspections, your financing, and your title escrow work. First, looking at the inspections. This is where you're going to have the home looked at. If you outline in your contract not to do inspections, well, you won't do them. But in most cases, you're going to want to have or have an inspection done. Typically, folks will hire a whole home inspector to go through the home, check all the light switches, outlets. If they're really good at knowing if there's a problem. They might not know the specific details, but like, hey, that just doesn't look right. And then they'll recommend you generally to a more specific person that can do things like, hey, I know that HVAC, something's looking wrong with it. It might be this piece of this piece. I recommend you get an HVAC tech here. They're really good at that. So you have the whole home inspected. And that's typically pretty quick. Your agent's going to generally, you get under contract. And they're like, all right, wonderful. Let's select our inspector. Pick your inspector, schedule that timeout. You usually have one to two weeks to get that done. And if there's problems, in most scenarios, you have a chance to try to work with the sellers to get those settled. But remember, if it was super competitive, they might not want or care to do a whole lot to the home. If not, then you might have a chance to be able to get some things done and fix on the home. So that's starting in one column. At the same time, your financing is really kicking off. Now, we love to make sure we get our pre-approvals up front and our pre-qualifications really sound, meaning got all your documents so we're in really good shape. So we don't have to bother you with so many questions when you're kicking off your inspections. But there's generally still things we have to get done. We got to order an appraisal for one. That is where we're going to essentially get your double check of value on the home. So that's where our VA loans require appraisal. Conventional loans generally will require an appraisal unless you can get a waiver for that. And we're going to have someone go out there and essentially do a more detailed analysis on the value. And they're generally good at the job. Not always perfect, but in most cases, they're going to be able to help tell us what the value is, why the value is what it is, and give us a chance again to negotiate with the sellers if there's a major issue. So the appraisal is an important one to get rolling. And for VA loans specifically, it's important to get that one rolling very soon. We order that near almost immediately unless there's a reason not to. And that's because you hear a lot of folks say, hey, it can take 45, 60 days to close a VA loan. That's nuts. It doesn't have to. One of the reasons why it can sometimes take so long is because of that appraisal process. We order it as soon as possible once we have the contract and things are looking good. That way we can do fast closes, 30 days, less than 30 days, not a problem. The other thing we're going to do on that financing side is make sure we get our underwriting rolling. We got a lot of your documents up front, but now we might have some additional conditions. Big one, for example, is needing an updated insurance policy. Insurance is a big piece of this. You'll need to get that set up. We'll need to make sure we get the insurance now specific to the property. We can always give estimates up front, like when we're doing that pre-approval, but insurance and taxes are two of those things that are really heavily dependent on the specific property that you're purchasing. So keep that one in mind as we're going along. This is where you're going to want to make sure you get your insurance policy finalized. Now, for that whole lending process, that's generally about another two-week period, sometimes three weeks if appraisal takes a little bit of time. So know that that part is going on simultaneously with the inspection period. Lastly, the title escrow work is going to kick off. Now, for you as a buyer, this doesn't take up a whole lot of your time, but just know that it is a whole other process that's being done that's very important. Your biggest part will be upfront with the earnest money or good faith money. Different parts of the country call it slightly different things. This is where you're putting up funds with your contract to say, hey, seller, here's my offer and here's a check attached with it that if we walk away for some reason outside of this contract, 
you can have it. Now, in some areas that's refundable, some areas that's not refundable, you're going to want to work with your agent to know what that's going to look like and how much of it is refundable or not refundable, depending on what conditions. Just know that that means, hey, you're putting money up front at the time of going under contract to show the seller in good faith that you're wanting to close this deal. That will typically be deposited with the title company. Sometimes it's an attorney, if it's an attorney state, or it even could be the real estate brokerage itself. But know that you're going to have to deal with that entity to make sure you get those funds deposited. The big part, though, for title or for an attorney's office, if your attorney's state doing it, is they're going to make sure that the owners truly own the home and that there's a clear chain of title, meaning that the sellers truly owned it. And before that, it was all transferred OK. And now we're going to transfer it properly to you. Very important part. The last thing you want to do is make sure transfer title and someone else then comes back and says, we own the home. I don't know. I bought the home. They're going to help make sure that one is taken care of. There's other videos that we'll have on title insurance, that kind of stuff. But just know title or attorney stays for attorney's sake. They are checking to make sure that one is in good shape to prepare it. That's anywhere from one to three weeks as well, that process. So all of this, that waterfall, of those three things kicks off immediately. As we like to say, the first two weeks, you're going to feel bombarded with a lot of stuff. It's going to feel like, man, buying this house is a lot of work. You're going through the inspection, negotiating that, clearing up any financing items, getting your earnest money put in. But then... Once those pass, usually around week two, things start calming down quite a bit, unless you have major inspection or appraisal issues. So I like to say, first two weeks, you're going to feel like you're really buying a house. The last two or three weeks before closing, whatever it is, until you close, you might wonder if you're buying a house at all. Because then it's calmer, everyone's wrapping up their ends, and we're getting ready to close. Which leads us to step number eight. Step number eight is to transfer your funds for closing. So this from the lender's side, we can have everything teed up and ready, and you're going to have estimates for what it looks like you're going to need to bring to closing. But it's usually not until the week of or week before that we're going to have that finalized and pinned down. Because think of it this way, you need to make sure you get through inspections, you get through appraisal, that there's no major contract changes. Because if there's some changes that can change the amount of funds that you might have to bring to closing or not bring to closing. We have VA loan buyers that bring no money to closing. Sometimes it depends on the scenario. But you want to make sure that that's all settled and that there's not going to be any contract delays. So typically, you're going to see the final, final numbers of what you need to transfer to generally it's going to be the title office or the attorney's office. You're generally going to have that the week of closing or the week before. And typically, those entities, the title office or the attorney's office, will take a wire transfer or cashiers or certified check. Know that no one's really taking cash and personal checks are usually off the board as well. Some places in small amounts, but usually that's off the board. Prepare for a wire transfer or certified cashier's check primarily. And you'll get that from a lender, but then you'll also get a final statement from the title office and the attorney. So once you have those funds transferred, then we're actually going to close on the property. This is where you sign everything. What does that exactly look like? For military families, that might mean that you're signing out of state. You don't have to be in the state that you're closing in. Some people assume they have to fly in to close out the property. Not the case. You can sign and we can work it so that things are mailed and taken care of. Just know you want to make sure you pre-plan for that and let us know or let your lender know beforehand that you're not going to be in the state. Makes a big difference for us, but it's a really easy thing to make sure we still have a smooth process on. Just got to plan for it. The other thing is some states, you might be in the room if you're there physically. You might be in the room with the seller or you might not. It just depends on the state and really the county on how it's done. But no, that's when you're signing the paper to actually own the home. Now, the last step that we have, step 10, is really take possession. Now, take possession is when you can go into the home, you're ready to move right on in, you get the keys essentially, right? The thought there, though, why we have those separate is because sometimes you will close on a property before you actually take possession of a home. For example, we'll sometimes have folks close on a home, but then they might rent back the home to the previous sellers for a week or two to help them get their stuff moved out. Very common. We see that a lot, especially with military moves. So know that possession date and closing date aren't necessarily always the same. And in fact, in some parts of the country, they delineate and break those two things out separately. So you want to pay attention to that in your contract. If your closing date is different than your possession date on those types of contracts, know that when you close, you might not be able to move in right away. Keep that in mind. Now, we're through our roadmap. Some key takeaways from that roadmap is this. Preparation usually starts about 45 to 120 days out from when you want to close on a home. We typically have folks come to us, especially for PCSs, they're coming around that 90, 120 day mark 
to start getting that preparation and know what they need to do with their finances. Again, it's important to do the financial review up front to get pre-approved because for military, if you have an issue on your credit or you have an issue with your VA certificate of eligibility, that's something that can sometimes take months to get fixed. And we're not like, necessarily like civilians where all of a sudden it's just, oh, I'll wait to buy that home. You got your report date and it's usually a hard report date, give or take a little bit. You gotta make sure that we're moving. So that's where we always recommend it's important to reach out in that 90, 120 day window. We even have folks reaching out six months, a year in advance. So they're on the radar and make sure it's taken care of. But make sure you give yourself time to prepare. The next key takeaway is knowing that the time for closing, it's different than preparation. The time to close on a home is usually 15 to 45 days. And we typically see it at about 21 to 30 day close window. And for us, very good with VA loans. We typically close our VA loans in that 21 to 30 day window to make sure you can get your home quickly. As a military buyer, it's important to work with a lender that can do things relatively quickly because think about it, that gives you a little more time to search for homes. If you got short orders and you found out you're moving in the next 60 days, it's good to have that extra seven to 10 days to look for a home, knowing that your buying process can be pretty quick. Next, VA loan is a very powerful tool for military. Know that it is one of the most powerful tools that we have and in about 85, 90% of situations, the VA loan is the best loan product to use when buying. It's what we strongly believe. It allows you to put no money down if you choose, but if you put money down, I mean, you put a down payment, you're actually rewarded on that. And we have other videos that talk heavily on it, but it's important to want to know VA loan is powerful for you. Next, if you're going to do a VA loan, know that the VA appraisal is not a substitute for a true home inspection. Some people, especially from older times, might assume that the VA loan has an inspection done. It really doesn't. The VA appraiser checks on some items in the home. It's like a habitability check. They're making sure there's no peeling paint. The home is habitable. You can live in it checking windows, wood rot from insects, that kind of stuff is what they're looking for. But it's not a substitute for a full home inspection. You want to make sure you have an independent third party doing that whole home inspection to check the HVAC, check the roof, check all those items because it's not the same thing. Next, get your team together. Make sure that you get your real estate agent and your lender on board at the beginning so you understand what you can go buy and how you're going to go buy it. The last two items really involve how you handle it on your end. And that is to make sure that you want to be involved. Sometimes folks assume for like us as the lender or the great real estate agents we get to work for and with that we're just going to do it all for you. We want to go out there and defend your work for you and make it happen, but you got to give us the input. So ask the questions, give us a feedback, listen, and make sure that you are involved in this process. It's not something you can just abdicate up in the air. It's a huge decision. Think of it this way. A good lender and a good real estate agent will enhance your decision making but you still gotta make the decision. Lastly, communication. Please make sure you prioritize your communication and you're fast with it. Typically, if we have a slow closing, it's because we've had slow communication from the buyer or the seller or the agents in between. And the agents we love working with are always very quick at that. The buyer side, make sure you prioritize it because that is what will help keep you going. So when you get requests from your lender, for example, try to get back to them within 24 hours. That is ideal. And if they're really saying, hey, we need this now, work to get that one for you to make sure you have a fast closing. Okay, going to some key term reviews. Major terms that we were just kind of hitting on some. Under contract is a big one. That simply means you're in step 10. You've got a signed contract from the buyer and the seller and you're rolling through that waterfall effect of inspections, financing, and title escrow work. Other major term that we have is the earnest good faith money. So this again is where you make that offer to the sellers and you say, hey, here's our offer. We're gonna give you this money attached with it if we happen to walk away from the deal, not due to the contract. So you wanna make sure that you talk with your agent though on is that refundable or not refundable? Different area of the country, treat it differently. But know that it's essentially, here's our offer, here's some money with it. If we walk away due to any reason outside of this contract, you can keep this, good faith or earnest money. Next, a mortgage. If you're new to buying a home, you might know what a home loan is because you know what a car loan is. You know what other types of loans are. Think of it this way. A mortgage is just a home loan. Simply put, take it that way. VA loan. It's a type of mortgage, a type of loan that is specific to military members. Veterans can use it, guard and reserve. And a lot of active duty members assume because it says veteran, they might not be able to use it. But yes, active duty military can use the VA loan. Closing costs. This is something that is really important to understand. Because yes, you have the price of the home, 
but then there's closing costs associated with buying a home. We typically see closing costs at one and a half to 3% of the sales price. What does this go towards? Generally, the primary reason for closing costs are to cover your taxes, your insurance, title fees, and sometimes lenders have some fees rolled in there as well. And you're going to get a break out of those sheet. And typically, depending on the area of country you're in, we usually see that at between one and a half and 3% of the sales price. Now, on VA loans, a little unique. You can do 0% down on the loan, but you still have those closing costs. However, the sellers if you negotiate it, can agree to cover some or all of those closing costs. So another thing to keep in mind when you're going through the steps of putting an offer in. Next is our appraisal. Remember the word appraisal just really means your double check of value. So appraisal, double check of value for if my home really is worth what we offered on. Not all appraisers are perfect, but it helps give you a good idea and you'll get a good detailed analysis of the value of the home. Escrow account. This could mean two different things. So escrow during the contract, like during the transaction phase, might mean that you are putting money with the title company or the attorney. The real definition of escrow is simply a third-party account to deposit funds. And so in the scenario there of the transaction, you might put your funds up with the title company or the attorney or maybe the real estate broker's office, and then it gets dispersed later, such as the earnest money or good faith money. Or us as a lender, we send your funds to buy the home usually do a title office for an attorney office, and they disperse it when you close on the home. So know that escrow just literally means third-party account. Now, from a lender's perspective, we might talk escrow as well as a third-party account once you have your mortgage of making it so that you can pay your insurance and your taxes in one payment. So rather than send a payment to us for principal and interest, send a payment to your insurance company and to the county for your taxes, Escrowing in your mortgage payment means that you can do it all as one lump payment. We have an escrow account that then pays out your taxes and your insurance. That's the other meaning for escrow. Lastly, contingency. Just know it means condition or requirement. If you ultimately have a contingency in a contract, that means, hey, we are going to buy your home, for example, contingent on an appraisal, contingent on us having an inspection. From a lender side, you sometimes might hear, hey, you are approved contingent on the sale of your old home. So a lot of folks will be moving, own one home and moving to buy another home, especially a lot of military families, happens all the time. And let's say you will qualify for this payment if you get rid of this old mortgage payment. So that means that you are approved for this loan contingent on this sale. What usually happens then is we line those up so the closings are right next to each other. We have had them within hours of each other so that you close on your old home and then you buy your new one and you have them set up back to back. It's an important thing to know. That's just what a contingent sale could mean. We hit on our key terms, some do's and don'ts of the buying process. Pretty simple. Do start as early as possible. Do get pre-qualified or pre-approved so you don't waste your time looking at the wrong homes. Do check your certificate of eligibility for using the VA loan. It's called your COE. If you're working with a lender who does it all the time, you don't have to go to the VA. We can pull that for you and tell you if there's any issues and what options we have if we need to make some changes. Do your due diligence. Do, do your due diligence. Told never to say do, do, but in this case, it's D-O-D-U-E. So do your due diligence, meaning make sure that you do your inspections, do an appraisal. And on top of that, again, your lender, your real estate agent are there to enhance your decision-making, not make the decisions for you. So make sure that you're paying attention, do your due diligence. Now, don't overlook closing costs. We just touched on it. Know that you have the price of the home, but there's generally some closing costs associated with it. So know if you need seller credits or not and have that discussion. Don't assume that the VA loan appraisal is a substitute for an inspection. Don't overextend your budget or make any major financial decisions when you're going through the loan process of buying a home. For example, don't go take out new credit cards or a new car loan while you're going through the home buying process unless you want to jeopardize your loan, because then all of a sudden that has to be taken into account at the last minute, and that could throw off your home buying. Don't assume that VA loans are slow. Again, we close those in 30 days or less makes a tremendous difference for our clients. If you hear 45 or even 30 plus days on a VA loan, don't assume they're slow. You know you can get them done quickly. So now three simple ways to improve your home value. This can help you when you go to sell or right when you buy just to make it nicer. 
And these are items that you can do either yourself or hire them out. Now, a lot of folks don't fully understand that a lot of renovations don't really improve your value. Unless you're a flipper or you're a contractor and just good at making changes to a home, a lot of things like a kitchen remodel, an addition to the house, those are break even at best. And again, unless you're really good at it, efficient and a flipper for a home. So the three major things that we see that are worthwhile that you can even do yourself to get the biggest bang for your buck. Number one, improving your landscaping or curb appeal. Number two, painting. That could be inside or outside the home. And then lastly, changing your lighting from the light fixtures to the light bulbs. So looking back at that landscaping, think of it this way. Your curb appeal is your first impression for a home. So let's say you're going to where you're selling it or you're just wanting to have a good fondue night or whatever people have these days when you have folks over to your home. You want to make sure it looks nice when folks walk up. But specifically when you go to sell your home, I've been on the side as real estate agent helping people buy and sell homes and I've opened up a lot of doors. Now as a lender, it chuckles me just how much folks need to put effort into doing that because here's the thing, you get up there sometimes and you might be standing on the porch for anywhere from a few minutes to 10, 20 minutes if it takes a while to get in. What does that exactly mean for owning the home? You want to make that porch, that front flower bed, the front yard look really nice because if that's nice, that really helps improve the ability not only to sell, but improves your value. Next, painting the house. I like to say it's like the equivalent of a human haircut. If you cut your hair, you can change a lot of things. When you're painting a room, you can turn it from a dungeon to the beach. But like cutting your hair, not all haircuts end up pretty, so make sure you pick a good color. Lastly, those light fixtures. Today, we have more lighting options than ever before. Not just the fixtures, which it's really important to swap out that old gold light, which some gold's coming back now, but swap out that old gold light fixture with the, the new in-trend color, be that black, silver, or the new gold or whatnot. But the other item to pay attention to is your lighting. Have you ever walked into a room and noticed there's like five different types of light? We now have daylight, we have warm light, we have beach light, we have all different kinds of lights. Get those to sync up in your house, and that really helps the flow, increasing that feel of value. So those are three quick things that you can do to help increase your value and also help improve your saleability. Again, my name's Evan Kaufman. We've at Home Loans, your VA loan originator. Really have enjoyed doing this for you. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. My email is evan at weavet.com, or you can send an email in to loans at weavet.com, and I really look forward to working for you on your next home move. Take care. Thank you.